Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. And away we go. Book of Jeremiah, he whom God launches forth. You know, uh, this happened in a time that is very much like we're going through today, giving us an example of how it was then, how it's going to end now. So it's very timely to understand this great book of um, of uh, Jeremiah. What, what he's done here is we completed that chapter one. There were seven things that God used against, kind of against the people that would come against God's plan. He's going to kind of lay that out in this chapter two. So without further ado, a word of uh, a blessing from our Father as we go into the scripture, chapter two, verse one, and it reads, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, now this is straight from our Father, okay? Verse 2, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. In other words, you, you were out there, there was nothing sowing, there was nothing growing. You needed food, and you were after me to bring manna and quail and part the Red Sea and give you guidance at night by fire and in the daytime a cloud to shelter you. You were right after my case to keep Pharaoh off your back. You, you were really very close to me because you were in need. Seems like our people, as long as they're in need, they, the first thing they turn to is their father, usually. And he doesn't like fair-weather citizens necessarily. He wants you to be with him all the time. He loves you, and he wants that love returned. Verse 3. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase... All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. If the Lord says it, hey, it's going to happen. Why? Because this is the hour of Satan's little old hour of darkness in this particular age. If you allow it, evil will come upon you, or you can be a servant of God and bypass all that stuff. Life is a little short to have to put up with it when you have your Father and His blessings when you turn to Him. Verse 4. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. This is, this is to the whole house, everyone. See, Jeremiah is written to Judah. We're including the whole family here now. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity, what sin have your fathers found in me? God speaking. That they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain. They're empty headed. They're void. That, um, they, they attend Beth of In, a house of nothing instead of the house of God. And uh, Father said, what, what have I done that caused them to do that? Again, I'll, I'll repeat, I fed them quail. I fed them manna. I, I guarantee I will protect you if you turn to me and uh, parted the Red Sea, brought you freedom. What sin can you lay to my charge? And naturally the answer is zero, not a. Verse 6, neither, neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? 
that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of droth and of the shadow of death, uh, and through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. Who could do that other than our Father? There was nothing out there. God had to provide for them all the way. And what, what Father is saying, it seems to me like they forgot about that pretty quick. Seems like they don't remember calling on me, asking my help. And it would seem they're, they're, now they find their substance in the world whereby they think they can build things on their own and leave me out of the picture. Well, inasmuch as God creates everything, that's pretty difficult to do. If you, you can build some huge building and call it God's house, and you can almost worship that house, but he created every stick in it, every brick in it. Our Father created all things. He doesn't want you to worship some house, Beth of Inn. He wants you to worship him, to love him. He has done nothing to you. Why would you turn on him and go into the traditions of men that make void the word of God, especially in this generation today? Seems like a lot of people do it, though. And they're, they're out there in a land that there is no uh, reason to it or common sense. And you can stand uh, anywhere you wish to through the ether waves. You can hear on this hand and on that hand and this hand, that hand, a bunch of grib, uh, gibberish <clears throat> when God sent you a letter telling you exactly how it's going to happen. And you listen to gibberish, and what do you end up with in your head? It answers itself. Vanity, emptiness, empty-headed. Verse 7. And I, and I brought you into a plentiful land. I did my part. To eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land. And made mine heritage an abomination. You, you, you allowed the... You allowed in the planting the devil to slip in through the tares, the Kenites. And many of you don't even know one from the other. And, and you keep plowing along with trouble knocking right at the door and act as though you, that nothing's happening and you're being played the fool because you're empty-headed. That's why you want to absorb God's word. Your heritage is ever, ever, ever so important. You're a child of the living God. He cares, and he wishes to take care of you, but you have to do it his way. You're not going to find any sin in him, and, but I bet each of you, if you look at your own self closely, you might find a little sin along the way. Verse 8, <clears throat> the priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. Now, if, you're, if you handle the law and you don't know God, you're, you're not much of a lawyer. Okay. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Anything that is not of God, usually if you claim it is from God, you're, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Who is Baal? False teaching. But thank goodness no false teaching takes place today. Oh, you don't have to study God's word is what some of the so-called pastors and teachers and prophets say because you're going to be gone, which is a lie. Nowhere is it written in God's word before the seventh trump that anybody's going anywhere and the false Christ comes at the sixth trump. Most children can count from one to seven. And yet, whole houses will turn on God's word. You don't have to understand God's word. You're out of here. That means you put your trust in man when Father is telling you different because you don't listen to him because of Beth of Inn. 
because of um, vainness, which is to say empty-headed. That's a sad, sad state of affairs. God knows it, and he's watching. You can understand now why he would bring forth seven word, the word against seven times in the last uh, two uh, verses of the last chapter. Verse 9. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. I, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up on my, my, my creation. I'm not going to give up on the house of Israel. I'm not going to give up on anyone. I'm going to bring the Messiah, and those that believe upon him and follow me will find that salvation. You know, it's a good thing that God has a lot of patience. Because if it were left up to man the way his children have done him, he would have disowned them. But no, God says, I I'm not going to give up on you. I'm still going to plead. That means I'm going to make it available. I'm going to reason with you. Come, come let's talk. Let's reason together. Verse 10. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see. Go look. And send unto Kedar. That's the dark skin. And consider diligently. You think deep on it. And see if there be such a thing. You see if any of them would do that. Verse 11. Hath a nation, some other nation, changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But, in other words, they, they, they stick right with the stick, studying their voodoo and all sorts of religion. You're, you're not going to change them. They're going to hang right in there on that. What God is saying, I, I kind of admire them for that. They at least don't wishy-washy and flip-flop. But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. They traded in the truth. They traded me for Satan. That that is wicked. That that is evil. And they choose to follow him instead of my loving, leading, blessing hand. You know, you can understand how you would almost have to be empty-headed to choose that route. When God loves and prospers his people, and you want to go off somewhere and, I mean, lose everything. You just, you've got to go it God's way. And as long as you stick with him and be patient with it, do it his way. Meet the conditions. Talk to him. Ask for guidance. You're going to do just fine because God loves his children. And as long as you don't turn, but what he's saying here is a lot of these people, you go to these countries that have strange religions, they haven't changed their gods. They're loyal to that. But my people sure aren't loyal to me. They change all the time. Listen, tickling my ears. Well, here's a church that teaches this, and they, this one laughs here, and this one falls there. And But do they ever get back to reading God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse? And I'm not judging anyone. I'm just telling it like it is. Stick with your Father and His Word and be blessed, be profited. Verse 12. Be astonished. O ye heavens, at this. And be horribly afraid, be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. And, and um, his, his wrath is building. He sees it. He understands it. Verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. Well, now, what is that? Well, let's find out. Two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. And naturally you know that Christ is the living water. That you, just as he met the little woman at the well in the New Testament, at Jacob's well, 
And he said, hey, if you partake of this water, you'll never have to draw that water again. You'll never thirst. She said, I, I think I would like that. And he said, well, go bring your husband. She said, I don't have one. He said, you rightly speak. You've been divorced uh, four or five times, and you're not married to the old boy you're living with now. And she said, I kind of sense maybe you're a prophet. And he converted her. She went into town and brought all the town out. God uses whomever he wanted to. He used that woman to convert a whole town into truth uh, because it was the living water. Now, I, I want you to understand the uh, equation here that God is giving you. What is a, a, a fountain produces water. It bubbles, it gushes, it comes forth. A cistern does not produce water. You understand? A cistern does not produce water. It is simply a reservoir dug, and you have to put the water in it. And anytime man takes his truths and traditions and dumps them in there, and maybe pretends that's the living water, it isn't. Because the living water fountain flows by the Holy Spirit, not by some man pumping stuff in. Okay. If man's pumping it in instead of God, you're in for a rough ride, friend. And God is making this simple enough that anyone can understand. Because Christ is that living water now that simplifies the whole equation, that simplifies the two evils. So um, never go to a place that doesn't have the actual fountain of God's word, the truth that flows chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and go to some place where there's a built-out, dug-out, hewn-out reservoir, and man dumps his little quarterdies in and says, thus saith thus, and thus saith thus, but never quite gets to teaching God's word. Does that make sense to you? Well, God doesn't appreciate it. When he put the word in our lap, right before us, and made it so simple that a child can understand it. I, I know that upsets some people when I say that, but if you'll throw out all the recap junk that man t attaches to the Word and let the words, God's Word speak for itself, anyone can understand it. True wisdom is to take away the difficulty and simplify the Word of God where anybody can understand it. That's true wisdom. That's the wisdom of God, because the love of God is the beginning of that wisdom. If you love him, you can't help but teach his word in the simplistic way of which Christ presents it. Uh, verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why is he spoiled? And really... Uh, when God does everything for him, you know, pe that's the mark of our people. They can't help being Jezreel, that is to say, fat, dumb, and happy. Uh, uh, when God blesses, they just seem to forget about God and want to kick up their heels and run wild. They're spoiled because God makes it so easy. And um, uh, it, it's... Uh, you know, what, what about, is he a homeborn slave? Do, who, who is Israel? There's 12 tribes. We pretty well know where the tribe of Judah is, in part. But where's the rest of the house? They, they, they call themselves Gentiles. When they're truly the offspring of the living God and the house of Israel that he promised would be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea, where are they? Again, I say, you know where Judah is. The house of Judah and the house of Israel are two separate entities today. They will be joined back together, but not yet. So what God is saying, look around you and tell me. Are you home born? Do you know who I am? Do you know who you inherit from? You inherit from our Father. That's what your heritage is. But you've got to claim it. Verse 15. The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His 
cities are burned without inhabit, inhabitant. Um, and, and so it is that uh, the, when you forget the traditions and when you forget about our Father and when you allow the old lion Satan, this is not the lion of the tribe of Judah, to come in, he will devour you. He'll take you over, but it will seem so sweet. Verse 16, and listen to this one. Also the children of Noth and Tehapanes have broken the crown of thy head. You, you run off down to Egypt to get Egypt to protect you, and they let you fall flat on your face. They, they couldn't help you do anything. What? You don't depend on nations. You depend on God. You turn your back on God and run down and get Pharaoh to help you rather than listening to the word of God. And guess what? You're going to have happen just what happened before. If you think today you could lean on Egypt, you are sadly mistaken. If you think today that you could lean on the brotherhood even, you are sadly mistaken and misled. We have our Father. That's who you must lean on. That's who you must listen to today. 17. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? You let it happen? In that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way. He showed you the path. He guided you offered that guidance, and no, you snuff at the air and go the way of, of, um, of the nations. Politics. 18. And now, what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? To drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do with the way of Assyria? To drink the waters of the river? Do you understand what it's saying here? It's, prof it's prophetic in a sense. It says you can drink out of the Nile or you can drink out of the Euphrates. It doesn't matter. It will not fill you. You have to drink from the flowing fountain of the living God. The waters that will allow you to never thirst spiritually. You can't let a river or man pour it in a cistern. Because God's word flows into your heart, mind, body, and soul. And it brings God's love and his blessings. So don't go the way of man. Don't lean on man. Well, we have to get our allies together. Give me God and you take the allies. It's time to look up and do it his way. It doesn't matter whether you drink out of the waters of Syria, Euphrates, and all the nations that join it, Afghanistan, Iraq, Turkey, and uh, many of the other nations. You think, uh, you think they're a big boost today? Look at them. What's happening there? Have they turned to God? Is it safety there? I think it answers its own, the question answers itself. Verse 19, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. You're going to wise up someday. And thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, you're my love saith the Lord God of hosts. Uh, um, what are you saying here? You ask for it, and boy, are you going to get it. You, you, I'll tell you what. This is a generation that it is dangerous for you to turn your back on Yahweh, the living God, the Savior, Yeshua of this whole world, for those that will believe upon him in peace and contentment, not bloodshed, not murder, not blowing up little children, as some would do, 
but loving the Heavenly Father and having his blessings in a nation that is free, free to worship his, him in his word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, a nation where we have the liberty and the license to broadcast to the world that real truth, that real word, the saving message that brings peace and contentment to from Almighty God to the world. Otherwise, hey, keep it up. He said, you ask for it. When we get to chapter 4, he's going to say, you push me. Once before, I destroyed the whole earth. He's talking about destroying the first earth age. I didn't leave one speck down there of life. I ended it. We'll cover that when we get to chapter 4. That's why I'm, I'm warning you. He's saying, pay attention. You ask for it, you're going to get it. Verse 20. For of old time, I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, bands and thou saidest, I will not transgress when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. You do not stay true to the word of God. You would rather play, well, well I, I saw that little church over there and it seemed like they were all so friendly and everything. I went over and yes, they, they, boy, they just welcomed me and as long as I gave them everything I had, that I, I was one of them. And they said I didn't even have to know the word of God, that they were all flying away. Well, that's not what God's word says if you've ever read it yourself, if you've ever studied it. If you, have, if you think that's the story, you've already forsaken God and don't even know it. Because... The sixth trump before we ever gather back to Christ, and we will gather back to Him. We've got work to do. Who do you think in in Mark 13 is going to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan? You think some sinner is? No, it's God's elect. It's Christian. They're not gone. They're here to stand against the false one. Have you ever read it? It's real easy. Mark 13. It's, it's, it's laid out exactly what will transpire uh, so that a child can understand. And I'll say that and back it up. So don't turn your back on God. He doesn't like it. And you see, he's in power. Whether you like it or not, it may seem like Satan gets his little way. But you start playing with other fire, that strange fire, you'll be burned. 21. Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, wholly a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? You know, um, here, have you ever read Christ's teachings about this vine? You know, Christ, uh, God, Christ is the vine, and we're the branches, and God is the pruner, okay? He whacks off branches that don't align with the, 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 the program. Also, he gave you a parable of the tares. Says, what have you turned into, a tear? A strange plant? And Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 35, what happens to the tares that are among the wheat. He said, he let you know who planted that strange vine. It was the devil. <clears throat> and that espoused the first murderer. Where did that murdering heart come from? The devil, of course. Have you ever read it? That's the teachings of Jesus Christ in Mark 13. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 13. The strange seed, the vine that doesn't fit, degenerate. And you don't want to go there. You want to stick with God's word, the truth, line on line, chapter by chapter, letting God speak the truth and don't be deceived in these last days. They trade uh, 
they trade the truth for fictions, and Satan is that fiction, the liar, the murderer. 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre, that's pretty strong chemical, my friend, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. I see it, I know it. I don't accept it. <clears throat> Verse 23, How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. You know what that valley is? It's hidden. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary, there, traversing her ways. You're like a female camel in heat chasing after lovers. That's what you're like in your religion. You, you, you chase after false teaching. You want to tickle my ears. Show me something new. There's nothing new under the sun. Our Father is the same yesterday, He is today, and He shall be forever. But what He's saying, you, you, you get all lathered, and you're bent out of shape, and you're going wild. Verse 24, a wild ass used to, used to the wilderness that snuffed up the wind at her pleasure in her occasion. Who can turn her away? Nobody can stop her. All they that seek her will not weary themselves in her month. They shall find her, her month of heat. When she comes into heat, you can't control her. That's the way God's children are when they seek these false teachings. Traditions of men that make void the word of God. And God is strongly, strongly against it. The two evils are there. Do not participate when man puts in the water and it is not the living water. That is say, to say the truth of the living God. Or you will be deceived. Our Father puts it a little straight at times because he wants to get your attention. Why he loves you. He wants you to see the danger when you pull away from him and his word, his truth. It's a dangerous thing. You can really, you know, you can get so wrapped up in the traditions of men that you can forget. And he uses those examples whereby you can visualize it and know how crazy they can be sometimes. You don't want to go there. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk. Instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, church, organization, we do not judge people. God is judge, leave, leave that to him, because he takes care of business. I think today gives you a good lecture, gives you a good example of how God takes care of business. It's not a good thing to have God angry at you. You're in a heap of hurt, if that be the case, and headed for much trouble, much distress. So always let him know you love him. Repent and 
have a good life. That's what he wants you to have. So don't go the way of, of the world. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. If you've got a prayer request, you don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Right now, he does. Why? He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is ab just different than anyone else. You're unique because he wanted someone just like you. But he, he wants you to not go the ways of the two evils. He wants you to love him for all, all that he's done for us and will do for us. What a blessing that is. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, and direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. All right, and question time. Where in the Bible does it talk about the first earth age and how it was destroyed? Well, the first earth age is it's real simple. We're going to discuss how it was destroyed in chapter 4 of this book of Jeremiah. We'll get there. And uh, it, it's a very interesting study, and that'll be just another day or two. But uh, the, the first earth age is spoken of many times. Second Peter chapter 3 gives you all three heaven ages and all three earth ages. And how it is destroyed, you can kind of read a little bit about why it's going to be destroyed when you read Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Satan misleads, and he's going to be turned to ashes from within. But um, our Father loves his children. You with companion Bibles, if you, ha you study Appendix 146, and you'll learn more about the destruction of that first earth age than maybe you wanted to know. It's called the Katobo. Um, Yuda Anda from uh, Minnesota. Uh, what does the scripture mean that says to dust your feet off? Please explain. That means dust the dust off your shoe, off your feet. People wore sandals, most sandals mostly at this time, and when you walked into a place, uh, you, your feet would get dirty and the streets were dusty. But if a city, rather than receiving the beauty of God's word, if it chose to reject you, it rejected the word. I mean, God didn't want anything to do with it. So we don't even take one little particle from that place and God's going to deal with it. Kick the dust off, even down to the little atom, off and leave that town and let God handle it from there. He'll do it. Many cities need to be paying very close attention to that. Many of them that through their politics try to drive God from their city they're going to be in a heap of hurt, and they're going to be begging him to come back before very long. Jake from Tennessee, who sits at the left hand of God? Nobody. Nobody sits on the throne with Almighty God except the right hand, and that is Emmanuel, God with us. Margaret from California, what scriptures in the Bible refer to hell? Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question. In the translations, the word grave and supplica are always translated usually hell, okay. and, and, uh, which, is, which is a false translation. It's not a good translation. It simply means that's a grave. The person that the grave was dug for, for the flesh body, is no longer there. They're with the Father anyway. Good, bad, and the ugly. That's what paradise is. That's why the gulf is in the middle. Bad people on this side waiting judgment. Good people on this side uh, immortal. But um, the word hell is, is uh, in one place where it is actual, and that is in Revelation chapter 20, the lake of fire. Because God is a consuming fire. That means they are consumed there. Blotted out done away with. Otherwise, it's simply speaking of a grave or a supplica. 
Ronald from Washington. In other words, what it means is that to be in that place, you're in holding for judgment by our Heavenly Father. Ronald from Washington. Other than Ezekiel 13, what of the scriptures document that God does not appreciate priests and scribes teaching the flyaway doctrine? Thank you for your teaching. You are welcome. Well, I'll use what I used earlier in the lecture today. What about Ezekiel 13? What about Mark 13? When Christ said, don't let anybody deceive you or lie to you, many is going to come claiming to be Christian preachers. I didn't send them, is what he's saying. Because in the end times, there will be earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. These are the beginning of the sorrows. Then they will deliver you up before the synagogue of Satan. Who is he talking to? Christians, his elect. They're not going to be gone anywhere. He's got work for them. They earn their keep. They proved they could do it even in the first earth age. That's why they were chosen. And they will stand against that false one. That's probably one of the better places that document. We got work here to do. Besides that, Christ is not building a kingdom off somewhere else. It's going to be right here on earth. Revelation 21 makes absolute certainty that heaven is right here on earth in the third earth age, heaven age and earth age. Johnny from Georgia, can a person anoint themselves with olive oil or do you need a pastor to do it? No, you can do it yourself if you so choose. You simply ask our Father to bless that olive oil as anointing oil. Put a little on the tip of your finger, touch your forehead and anoint yourself. And it is not the oil it is your obedience to use it in prayer or in anointing. This is why, where is that documented for a Christian to do that? Uh, James chapter 5 said, if, you, if you're ill, call the elder, anoint, and ask God to do the healing. The oil doesn't do it. It's your obedience to do it. Do, do you understand why? Because what do you think the word Christ means? Has anybody ever told you? Christos. It means the anointed one. That's, that's what it means. The etymology of his name means as anointing by rubbing our oil. Okay. That's what his name means. And, and that's why we use anointing oil. That's why we anoint. With anything that's sick, even if it's a home, in order Satan or anything negative out of it. Elmer from Missouri. We ask it in Christ's name, and Christ does, the, and the Holy Spirit uses the power. Elmer from Missouri, where in the Bible does it say that Satan is going to be here two and a half months? It's a cipher. We know from Mark 13 that I've mentioned so many times in this broadcast, the time, Jesus said, the time for the elect's sake is shortened from seven years down to what? Well, Revelation chapter 9 stipulates five months. It's all sharpened down. But sharpened down. Well, we know from Daniel that that seven years was broken into halves, three and a half and three and a half. And that's why it's written in um, uh, Revelation chapter 13 that the evil one will have 42 moons. That's three and a half years. Short a little, but that's what it means. The two witnesses will have 1,290 or 60 days, which is it? That's three and a half years. So it's broken in the half, so what happens if you break five months in half? You've got two and a half. That's just a cipher. Will it happen that way? Well, I don't know, but that's, uh, call it an educated guess or however you wish. Um, it would seem that God never changes his policy, even though he shortens time sometimes. Anthony from Florida. Can incest be forgiven if someone has committed incest at a very young age and has truly repented for it, will God forgive him? Should that person take their own life if they can't be forgiven? Absolutely. It is, for, it is not the unpardonable sin. And Christ paid an awesome price for forgiveness. And when young people do things they're not even uh, in ignorance, um, then it is doubly forgivable. By that I mean on repentance. 
So uh, don't even think such a serious thought or let anyone put it in your head. It, it's not the unpardonable sin. Repent and don't even bring it up again to God or anyone else. It's erased. Uh, Laura from Georgia. That doesn't make it, I want to make one thing very clear because the letters will come. I did not say that it makes it all right. I said it is, unfor it is forgivable. Laura from Georgia, for a very young person that is, if, if somebody that knows better an adult, the penalty is quite severe. Uh, Laura from uh, Georgia. I have been watching your program for a short time, but I also attend a local church. I am confused about tithing. I am very poor and can hardly pay my bills, but I don't want to neglect paying my 10% to God. My local church has told me to give them all my money and then trust God to meet my needs. Uh, they have said that if things go really bad, I can ask the church for help. Well, it got bad, and I asked the church for help, and they yelled at me and made me feel ashamed and told me of, I wasn't trusting God. Now I can't pay my tithes or my bills. What should I do? Well, how much did you, in working, how much did you make? You made zero. So how much do you owe with zero? You don't owe a tithe. So um, when, when you're on a fixed income, give a love offering, which is a pittance, if, if nothing else. But don't, God doesn't send out beggars, okay? And when a church, it, it does not even make common sense for someone to say, give all of your money. What if, how are you going to pay your bills if you give the church all your money? You know, you expect a miracle? Uh, you see, God doesn't entertain fools. And I'm not calling you a fool, but only a fool would listen to a church like that. Okay, that's just the way it is. I'm not calling you a fool because you, you, you've outfoxed them. I, I, if I were you, I would really think very seriously about continuing there if they made light of me in that way. Uh, pay your bills and buy food and your medicine and a love offering, little pittance, if it's possible. John from California, are there any scriptures that describe Jesus' appearance? Sure. Um, probably one of the better ones is uh, Isaiah chapter 53, where it's, it gives his credentials, and then it says he lacks nothing calmly in beauty. In other words, he, he was a beautiful person, handsome, and lacked nothing, had it all. Uh, of course, you know something? In Ezekiel chapter 28, um, along about verse what, 10, somewhere along in there, Christ our father said to Satan, I made you the full pattern. That's Tyrus, which is rock in the Hebrew tongue. He's not our rock. He's a fake rock. But it made him a beauty too. That's why a lot of people are deceived by him if they're not careful. Stella from Kentucky. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is it a sin for women to wear pants and cut their hair? You know, when, um, when Deuteronomy was written, <clears throat> Men wore skirts. Okay, a pantsuit is not men's clothing. Besides, let's get down to the nitty gritty. When it says a woman should not wear men's clothing or that that pertains to man, it means a woman should not do the sexual part of for a man in a sexual act. And and uh, quite the other way around, even so with man. Man should not do that. <clears throat> but um, what, what about hair? And you're talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's talking about you have to have your head covered. It's not with hair. It doesn't matter whether you cut your hair or not. It's having Christ over your head because of verse 10 of that 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians because of the angels. Those fallen angels are going to be kicked out. They're returning back again in this generation. They look for women. And with Christ over your head, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, Deborah from New Jersey. My question, Pastor, is it wrong to leave my aunt in a nursing home after suffering from a major stroke in June 2010? 
uh, she is my military dependent. The doctors, nurses, canes, along with the case worker said that she needs 24-hour care, which I cannot give her because I do not have the handicapped equipment, shower bathing, and so forth. Um, and um, maybe retired, simplify. You know, your love for her, your love for her, uh, gives her 24-hour treatment. She needs it. And being your dependent, don't don't feel that um, you are neglecting her. You're visiting her, and you're seeing that she has that ample uh, care that she needs um, in, in that condition. Uh, when a person tries to take care of somebody that is has problems uh, physically, mentally, and otherwise. Um, it's just not fair to that person, the handicapped person, because they need that care and need to be monitored. You're doing a good thing, and God loves you for it. Butch from Oklahoma. Pastor Murray, do you or do you not burn in fire until you are no longer exist? Or is hell just a grave where a person is not tortured or burned? Well, uh, the lake of fire is very much a lake of fire, but it blots out. And um, in spiritual bodies, this is difficult for some to understand. You've got to come with me. At the beginning of the millennium, that's the last thousand-year period of the millennium, everybody is changed into a spiritual body. A spiritual body does not know pain as we know pain in the flesh. Okay. It's, it's, it's non-existent in that respect to a spiritual body. And this is why it states God is a consuming fire. And it's, it's for spirit. It's something that we do not see today, nor, nor some could completely understand. But when you go into that lake of fire, don't worry about being tortured. The, the spiritual body feels no pain. But certainly uh, it is uh, erased so that we don't even remember them anymore if they don't make it. That's why there are no tears in heaven. You don't remember those that didn't make it. It's, there's nothing there to weep over. They're just not there, and they're gone up here as well. And so it is. God is a consuming fire, and he blots out what doesn't belong. We, you know, we're going in for the long run. We've got a lot of trouble now. We can see the wickedness. We don't want those around us. We want peace, love, and, and completeness. So therefore, they have to be um, blotted out. That would cause trouble because we don't want them. God doesn't want them. Uh, Joanne from Oklahoma. Will the devil be here during the millennium? Thank you. No, he, he will be here. But read the first two verses of Revelation chapter 20. He's in a pit, abyss, and he is bound. It, it, is, a, it is a very difficult word to translate. It means there is a band around him, a containment band, that not even his spirit can escape from it, meaning not even his evil spirit can penetrate that and bother people during that thousand-year period. It's going to make teaching a lot easier. No wickedness can come from him during that period of time. But then he is released a short season, and boy, will it flow then. Okay, we got uh, Edwin from Wisconsin. My wife Janet passed away in August 9-11. Well, bless your heart. Will, will she know me as her husband when I get to heaven? Of course she will. You, you, can, you can find documentation for that in Ezekiel chapter 44. You see, from chapter 40 to the end, it's the millennium where you are there in a spiritual body as she is already there in a spiritual body. And it stipulates that you will be able, if, even if a mate didn't make it, you will recognize them and be able to help them. So naturally, you're going to see them, or you couldn't recognize them. We will, of course, know them. Uh, okay, Charles from Hawaii. 
Uh, I I have but one question. Uh, I don't think many ask. I know that God is a spirit, and we must worship His <clears throat> Him in spirit and in truth. My question is: Does our Father God have the Holy Spirit in Himself, or is the Father our God the Holy Spirit? Uh, the what is the Holy Spirit? It's the Spirit of God. God doesn't. God's Spirit can come here, as promised by Christ, without God having to be here. His Spirit can intercede, intercept, can strengthen, can help, can love, can enter, um, and but so can Satan's evil spirit if you allow it. <clears throat> so that's that's what this earth age is about. Do you choose God or do you choose Satan? God wants to know, and that's what it's about. The Holy Spirit is naturally God's Spirit. St. John chapter 14, if you understand the word abide, Christ and the Father wanting to abide in you, that's when he promises the comfort or the Holy Spirit to dwell with you. You might make a little study of John, St. John chapter 14, and I'm out of time. Hey. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes His day when you read the letter He has sent to you. It shows your love for Him. And when you do that, when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. You can count on it. Why? He loves you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word, it's a good day even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra-wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student.
Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We just praise God for the privilege of being able to study His Word with you. You know, man's word sometimes can be reassuring, comforting, but then you've always got to go double check it out in God's word, so why not just stay in the word and have the surety that you're on the right track? That's the way I feel about it, and that's why we have the format of teaching chapter by chapter and letting our 